Thanks, Amy. And if you've got your Bibles open, please do keep them open. With a chunk of text like this, we're going to try and, and dive into it the whole time, but it won't all be on the screen. So, um, yeah, keep your, keep your Bibles open with you. It's great to be preaching again this week. I think it's been a month that I've had off. Thanks, Richard. I, I said to um, this week I, I felt a bit out of practice. So, <laughs> so, um, so let me pray and ask God to help us to just pray again. Father, thank you for your word that shows us, especially today, what you are like. Now speak to us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. In our midweek group, uh, we eat a lot of cake. <laughs> and you might be looking at me and going, yeah, I can see that. Um, and, and, and so because cake on Wednesday when I started was on my mind, I, I thought it would be helpful today not to think of our sermon as a three-point sermon, but as a three-layered cake. I think I have a picture there. Look at that. That's almost as good looking as the ones we have on Wednesday. Um, think of it as a three-layer cake, each layer strengthening our understanding of what's happening in this account in John's Gospel. So we're going to kind of go around the story three times, each time just building on what John is telling us and what we can see here. Now, I need you to do the difficult thing of forgetting about the cake and uh, joining me as we think through the first layer. Layer one is that these signs, the feeding of the 5,000, the walking on the water, point us to Jesus' creative power. So I think it's almost a, a couple of straightforward stories. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you're probably familiar with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus walking on the water. And John begins his account with, after this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee. Now, the after this tells us that it's a section break, a whole new unit, that's chapter 6 is. And then he gives us the first of a number of details that Galilee was also known as Tiberias. It was named that in honor of Caesar. Now, these little details that you catch in there are scattered throughout this account, as in verse 4 when he explains that Passover is a Jewish feast. And these things show us that John is writing for an audience that is both Jewish and non-Jewish. They would know some things and they wouldn't know some things. It's also telling us that this is a witness remembering detail. So detail, like there was green grass in that place, verse 10. All the loaves were barley loaves, which incidentally was the food of the poor. This is the account of someone who remembers the details and who can look back in retrospect and remember what happens. As we see in verse 6 where he says, ah, Jesus asked Philip that question because he was testing him. That's the word of someone who remembers back and knows what has happened since. When you read the Gospels, Look for those little things, those little gems that remind you that the men like John were there. This is a history, almost like presented as straightforward history, even though it's marvelous. So Jesus, we're told, looks to get away with his disciples, but this huge crowd follow him, and Jesus wants to know where they can get food to feed him. Philip answers in a way that makes me think he was an accountant, and he says, look, Jesus, we don't have enough money for all of them. Um, and Andrew, who's the joker of the bunch, says, well, there's a kid with his lunchbox. Well, then maybe that won't be enough. And Jesus says, okay, tell the people to sit down, verse 10. There's calm in that instruction. Hey, just very simple, have them sit down. There's order in it. And they sit down. Jesus took the loaves of this boy. He prayed, he broke them up. And it fed the more than 5,000 people. They were told that there were 5,000 men. It was obviously one boy, must have been more, <laughs> and there was enough for them to be satisfied with more than enough left over. Straightforward history. But in this act, you see a man do the things God would do. He creates, he makes something, and he does so in order to sustain and feed and care for people, like God did in Genesis. God made things, the world, he made this garden. And he put the man in the garden, and he put trees in the garden in order to sustain the man. God provided for his people, and Jesus shows this type of creating, sustaining provision as well. And when the people have eaten, they want to make Jesus king, so he, he walks away from him. And then comes this, I have to admit, the story I've always found quite weird, the walking on the water. I've never understood what it's doing there, uh, what, what is its point. And it's Jesus walking on the water in order to get to the disciples on the boat. So look at verse 18. I think it's up there. It says, A high wind arose, 
and the sea began to churn. Now, if you remember Revelation last year, the sea is symbolic in Jewish thinking of chaos and disorder. And so the disciples are caught up in disorder and chaos, and Jesus comes towards them and he takes them out of it. We're not told here that he calms the storm as he does in the story in Mark, but he does rescue them from this churning sea. Jesus brings us into calm from the storm, order out of disorder. He creates, he feeds. At the very least, the base layer of this cake is the point that Jesus can do the miraculous. He can do the godlike. This is who he presents himself as being. And for those of you who are uncertain of Jesus, uncertain about what Christianity is all about, this is the key starting point. You know, the question, who is Jesus? Even for those Christians here for whom the last year has kind of shaken you a bit. What are you doing, God? What are you doing? What what does it mean for me to be a Christian in a world like the world we're living in today? This is where you want to start. Look at what Jesus does. Order, creation, provision. He does what God does. He shows himself to be working, as he said in chapter 5, like his Father is working. That is our base level. This is God walking amongst humanity. Now, the next layer is not just that it's the act of God in creating, but also the act of God in rescuing. That's point number two. The signs point us to Jesus' role as rescuer. One of the books that we've worked through as a church is Exodus. Now, if you can't remember it, I don't blame you. The last time we looked at Exodus was the beginning of 2019. But I'm going to call it. Okay, we've looked at that book. (laughs) And as you read through this passage of the feeding and the walking on the water, you're meant to remember the Exodus and Moses, who already was mentioned last week. Now, it's not that John actually sees Jesus merely as another Moses, though that's there as well, taking the people out. John is pointing us to the fact, much more audacious fact, actually, of Jesus being the God of the Exodus. So have a look with me at this story again. Jesus meets with his disciples. They're the leaders of his new people. They meet on a mountain, as God met with his leaders on a mountain in Exodus, a mountain called Sinai. Jesus uh, eats with them as God ate with his people, which we saw a few weeks ago in Mountain Men. Jesus provides his people with heavenly bread as God provided his people with manna. Jesus is not just eating with the representatives of his people. He's eating with his people, all of them, the 5,000 and at least one more. Now, what happens in Exodus, just after the wilderness wanderings and the the meeting with God at Sinai, um, sequentially it happens quite soon after that, is that Moses says to God, please may I see your glory. And God replies, okay, I will hide you in a cleft of a rock and I will pass by you so that you can see something of me. And God says to him, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name, the Lord, before you. Now, the Lord, the I am. Come back to John. After the whole meeting on the mountain, feeding, etc., you get the walking on the water. You see it in light of Exodus, and this whole thing is actually exceptionally exciting. The leaders of Jesus' new people climb in a boat. And in the midst of wind and waves, Jesus, if you look again at verse 19 um, of John chapter 6, I think it should be there. After they'd rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. He was coming, and the Greek word can be translated literally, passing by near the boat, and they were afraid. He shows himself to them. And they are afraid, like the Israelites were afraid of God in Mount Sinai. He shows himself to them and says, it is I, verse 20. Now, the Greek, it is I, can literally just be, hey, it's me. But they are the words that are used when translating God's words to Moses, I am. Jesus can be saying, it is me, don't be afraid. But kind of hidden meaning in there is also saying, I am, don't be afraid. In this chapter, the claim Jesus makes in in chapter 5 that he is working as the Father is working is fleshed out more. We see him recreating aspects of the Exodus. We see him identifying 
more and more as the I am, as Yahweh, the Lord. Why does he do this? Because not only does he want to show himself as creating and providing, he wants to draw our attention to the fact that he has come to rescue. He's come to redeem his people like God did the Israelites out of Egypt. So John actually sets that scene for us in the beginning when he points to the fact that it was nearly Passover. It's not just a historical point, though it is that. It is more as a theological meaning to it. Jews would remember God's rescue of his people out of Egypt, and they would see the feeding and the walking on water in light of that. So stop and think about this for a moment. What, what things come to mind? Well, there are a few. Number one, there's no disconnect between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. I know some people often think the two are a bit different, but no, the Creator is the rescuer all the way from the beginning. The act of redemption shows just how different the Lord is to what we might expect from a God or from God. So those of you who know something about the ancient gods will know just how utterly different they were to this. Then gods would be in it for themselves. They would take what they wanted, whether it's your stuff or your spouse, and tough for you if you got in the way. Those of us who live in today's world view of things, we live by the understanding and learning that we are in it for ourselves and by ourselves. And we shouldn't expect help from anyone or anywhere because we've got to do it ourselves. It's why so many of you, even in this church family, are suffering by yourself, thinking that you will be judged for asking for help and feeling like you may not have help because we live in that worldview. But along comes Jesus, who identifies himself as a provider, a rescuer for those who are unable to provide and rescue, for and rescue themselves. And it's actually in chapter 6, as we go through it over the next few weeks, it is this type of provision that Jesus gives that is the stumbling block for so many Jews of his day as it is for so many people today because it goes against our view of self-sustenance, self-provision, self-rescue, self-determination. We'll talk more about it next week, but already here, the people see what Jesus is doing and they're going, oh, this is cool, we want more of this. And they get him wrong. They think that Jesus is the prophet, the one like Moses promised in Deuteronomy, and that's right. And they're so excited about this, they want to make him king, thinking that like Moses led them out of Egypt, Jesus will lead them out of Roman occupation. And it's not the right conclusion. Jesus walks away from them so that there's not a bloodbath, and he goes and be, stays by himself. What he wants to provide is this eternal life that he will speak of more this chapter, and his rescue from sin and death. That's what he wants people to understand about him. That's what he wants you and I to understand about him. And in showing us this account as he's written it, John is not just remembering what he witnessed. He wants to point us to the fact that Jesus is making a people for himself, rescuing from slavery to sin and death, and that as he rescues us, he will provide for us. He is the king, he's the Messiah, and by believing in him for who he is and what he's done, you will have life. That's middle layer of the cake. Base layer, he's the creator God. Base, uh, layer two, he is the redeeming God who calls us to be family with him. The third layer, and I've cheated here, and it contains the icing and the cherry and everything else on top, is that not only can, do, can Jesus do this, not only does he show himself able to do this, he actually shows that he wants to do this. Jesus shows us that he is for us. We sing that song sometimes, don't we? Sing with joy now. Shall I do it? <laughs> no. Sing with joy. Our God is for us. The Father's love is a strong and mighty fortress. We sing it. I wonder how many of you believe it. Our God is for us. I think many Christians still have the idea of God in their head, that he is the headmaster who looks up as you enter the door as if you're A, disturbing him, B, come for detention again, or C, both. As if he's sighing deeply in his heart and going, oh, not you again. At what point can I expel this kid? You feel that especially when you think you deserve detention. 
Did you know that the first words God used to describe himself when he passed by Moses back in Exodus, the words Peer used when he prayed, when he started, were the Lord, the Lord, the gracious and compassionate one, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I might have that there, yes. The Lord, compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth. Those are the first things he says about himself, the gracious and compassionate one. Is that how you think of God? Is that how you think God is geared towards you? He's not a cross headmaster. His heart towards you is full of compassion. That's why he sent Jesus, whose heart is the same. Jesus sees the crowd hungry, and while John doesn't mention it, the other writers do, he has compassion on them. He wants to provide for and care for his people. That's why he died to rescue us. Because his heart, the heart of the Son whose work is the same as the Father's and is one with the Father, his heart is geared that way toward you as well. That's why if you do turn to Jesus, he will welcome you. No matter where you've been or what you've done, no matter whether you've been a terrible person who has done nothing right your entire life, or a model citizen with a hardened heart towards God, and you feel that now is the time to actually truly submit to Him, even after decades of pretending, He will welcome you. And perhaps today, guys, one of you needs to understand that, hear that, and believe that. And because His heart is like that, that is why, Christian, when you come to Him for the thousandth time, walking in there with the same sin, having just been committed again, his primary attitude towards you is not, oh, not him again, which is what ours would be. But thankfully, he is not like us. His one is of a compassionate father whose heart goes out towards you, even in your sin. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. That's a true thing. He doesn't berate and shake his head. He pulls you in, forgives you again, and encourages you to try again to work out your faith with fear and trembling. Why? Because he is working powerfully in you. Have a look at what Jesus says on the water. Verse 19 of John 6. After they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the water. He was coming near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him on board. As he passes by the boat, the disciples are terrified, not at the wind and the churning waves, but at him. And he says to them, I am, don't fear, it's me, don't be afraid. So many of us Christians still live in fear of Jesus, like we do of God, even after we are His children. You don't need to fear the one who has died to give you life and who proved His love for you in that act. The first thing God says to Moses about Himself is the Lord, the Lord, the gracious and compassionate one. The first thing Jesus says to His disciples as He passes by them is, do not be afraid. John writes in chapter 1, that they had seen the glory of the Word of God, who was with God in the beginning, who was God. They had seen it, full of grace and truth. And the Word Himself says to His people, it is I, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of Me, even though I am the Holy One, and you are not. You know that Martin Luther, the great reformer, before his aha moments, he would stand in the church of his town and look up at the figure of Jesus hanging on the cross, and he would be terrified of him. The first time he ever took a communion, he was so terrified of this Jesus on the cross that he would strike him down because he wasn't worthy. He lived in fear of Jesus. He hated God, even as a monk. He never saw Jesus as his Savior. He saw Jesus purely as his judge. He feared that, 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 that judge there, Jesus says to his disciples, don't be afraid, even though I am the judge. We saw that in chapter 5. You don't have to be afraid of me if you're mine. 
You don't have to be afraid of following after me. Even though you're not always certain how to do it, I will show you how to do it. You don't have to be afraid of following after me even when you fail because I'm gracious and compassionate. I and the Father are one. You don't have to be afraid of following after me even when life is tough and storms are all around because I will provide in the wilderness. The things we say easily but start to mean a whole lot more when our world is as small as it is, is you don't even have to be afraid of following after me even when the Taliban take over. That's what our brothers and sisters are experiencing this week. You do not have to be afraid. It is I. You know, when you follow after Jesus, not the Jesus the crowd thought would be king then, but the Jesus who rescues you from slavery to sin and death. Life on earth is not always straightforward. It is not always easy. And the guys in Afghanistan, Nigeria, the Middle East, North Korea, they, they know that even more. But in the feeding of the 5,000, you see not just the compassionate heart of Jesus, but you see something else too. We're getting to the, towards the end now, so just with me a little bit more. John 6, 12, we read this. When they were full... Or satisfied, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Not the fish, interestingly. Either, either ate it all or they don't like leftover fish. 12 baskets. It's a symbolic number. If you remember Revelation, the, the people of God. Following after Jesus might not always be easy, it might not always be straightforward, it might not always be safe, but he provides not only enough, over-the-top extra. Not just sufficient, abundant. Sometimes in physical provision, so that we can be gracious and generous with that. Sometimes in grace to face spiritual trials. Sometimes in grace to face physical trials. Definitely, at his return, at the wedding banquet, at the new creation, more than enough for all his people to enjoy and rejoice, and he will provide. So three layers. Jesus comes as God on earth and has the ability of God to provide. He has the ability of God to rescue. And more than that, he has the heart of God, gracious, compassionate, that makes him want to. It is demonstrated in these signs, and it is proven beyond a doubt at the cross. So what do you do with this? We like to do things. What do we do with this? Number one, let it change your mind. Let it cause you to know how Jesus acts towards you because of how he feels towards you. Number two, let it change your heart. Let it warm your heart. Take this and rejoice in it. That God is for you. If you well, God is for you before you, are, before you are His, because He comes and gives Jesus. And when you are His, He's definitely for you. You're His child. He loves you. Let that give you hope and courage and peace. Let it drive out fear. Change your mind. Change your heart. And then... And perhaps only then, let it shape and change your heart to be more like Jesus. To be compassionate to those around you in need. Whether it's need of food, or water, or electricity, or provision of health, or friends, or family. Or especially in the need of meeting this king who felt the nails in his hands and feet for you and for them. So take a moment now, come to God, speak to him, the gracious and compassionate one. And without fear, say sorry and accept and delight in the forgiveness and love and care he has for you. Take a moment and then I'll close for us in prayer.
Today in the church calendar is the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. And I found this prayer this morning that I thought was very suitable. The prayer for the day. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we are to pray and constantly give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down on us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen.